afternoon. So I did change uh, the type of my talk, and uh, it doesn't fit in the education track. It does to some extent align with education and training, but I thought that I would provide some feedback on the talk that I gave as part of a panel discussion at this meeting two years ago, because Ranga, in fact, asked me to speak about PAN-D, which um, was an NIH-funded collaborative hub, which has come to the end of its lifespan. Um, and I spoke about mentoring uh, and our experiences of mentoring uh, in that uh, research hub as I was primarily uh, involved in the empirical research and led the research capacity building component, not only uh, within the countries that form part of the hub in Africa, but also uh, I, I at some point led capacity building across the five hubs at the time, which uh, spanned uh, the African continent, uh, Latin America and Asia. So um, the capacity building activities really entailed uh, bespoke workshops, fellowships, uh, seed grants that were awarded competitively to early career researchers, and then mentoring. And mentoring was a, a strong focus uh, of the hub. Um, and we identified 35 early to mid-career researchers. So over the five-year NIH-funded uh, hub, uh, those early mid-career researchers published uh, 60 papers, um, and 21 of those 60 papers were in fact first authored by them. Uh, they also secured uh, 21 successful grant applications, most of them were internationally funded applications. And to this day, uh, in terms of the mentoring-mentee partnerships that were set up, uh, many of them have continued to be successfully mentored in those partnerships. So that's just uh, some feedback. The empirical research was a very interesting project, and perhaps at the next uh, African diaspora meeting, if I'm called back to speak or share my experiences, I can provide some findings of the randomized controlled trial, which is a cluster randomized controlled trial um, of collaborative care between traditional healers, complementary uh, and alternative providers, and primary health care providers. Uh, in delivering treatment for psychosis, uh, first episode psychosis, as well as to patients with chronic schizophrenia. Uh, and so the results are very interesting and indicate that collaborative care can work and can in fact reduce the harmful treatment practices that exist uh, in many parts of Africa where uh, the majority of patients seek care from traditional healers before uh, conventional care. But to get to the uh, topic of my uh, talk. So I think my talk aligns very nicely with uh, Dr. Shemington, keynote speaker's talk this morning. Um, and I'm going to focus primarily on um, interventions to think about how we might uh, deliver interventions in a more feasible, effective, um, and uh, cost-effective way, even though uh, the uh, data that I'm going to share with you, which is really just a snippet of data uh, from a study that we conducted, which was really a proof of concept trial, uh, was not one that included a uh, cost effective uh, element or component. And I'm hoping that in a future trial that we do, we will have the funding to, um, to, to evaluate cost effectiveness. So um, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, as has been um, uh, elucidated this morning, is a, is a, is a prevalent condition uh, in youth. Uh, and most of the data on uh, trauma exposure and post-traumatic stress disorder on the African continent focuses on adult populations. And most of the studies are community-based studies rather than uh, clinic-based studies. So um, I'm going to uh, provide just a brief overview of the scope of the problem of PTSD um, and speak more specifically about um, findings that come out of South Africa and then um, highlight through a task sharing intervention um, study that was conducted uh, how we might think more about conducting multi-site a randomized controlled trials using task shifting as a paradigm for the delivery of um, fairly elaborate uh, psychological interventions for youth. 
So, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, I suppose I don't need to say this to this audience, is a multifactorial uh, disorder. It has um, heterogeneous pathobiological determinants, and we currently have no disease-specific, tractable, and clinically actionable biomarkers. And as uh, Bonga has highlighted, um, much of my interest is about trying to identify genomic and epigenomic uh, contributions to post-traumatic stress disorder. So um, in the DSM-5, it is one of the key trauma and stress-related disorders. Um, and in South Africa, and in fact, this mirrors many African countries, um, the rape, sexual assault, physical assault, domestic violence, community and gang violence, which is highly prevalent uh, in this province uh, in South Africa, uh, childhood uh, abuse and neglect, and witnessing interpersonal violence are the most prevalent traumatic exposures that give rise to PTSD in youth. Now, when we think about the trajectory of uh, the disorder uh, post-trauma, I think that looking at an uh, average point prevalence, uh, which is 16% from a number of meta-analyses that have been conducted, is in some ways deceptive because it masks the variation in the prevalence of PTSD over time. And I think what this trajectory shows is that there is a spontaneous remission of symptoms in the first three months um, post-trauma, but that in youth, uh, after six months, the prevalence of PTSD remains stable. So the prevalence, as well as the symptom severity over time, uh, remains stable, and there's little uh, change uh, in that trajectory unless intervention uh, is uh, introduced. So um, in South Africa, uh, the prevalence of post-traumatic stress disorder in children and adolescents uh, is approximately 20%. So one in five youth from community studies, so from community settings will develop PTSD. In clinic settings, that is in fact two in five. And if you add on um, partial post-traumatic stress disorder or subclinical forms of the disorder, that adds another 20%. So an additional one in five youth will present with subthreshold PTSD. And we have found in clinic-based studies that the degree of functional impairment and disability in youth who have partial PTSD is equivalent to those who meet full criteria. And I think that is important to bear in mind, both in terms of assessment and um, early intervention. So um, we know uh, from um, a wealth of data, from an accumulation of data that um, as in adult populations, it's really only a minority of trauma-exposed young people who develop PTSD, and that post-trauma factors, in particular social support, is um, an important determinant of PTSD. And if you look at uh, meta-analyses of uh, risk factors quantifying the um, effect of risk factors on the development of PTSD, the lack of social support, uh, is in fact the strongest factor that has been identified to date. So what about intervention? So we know now that psychological treatments for PTSD in children and young people are highly effective and the uh, evidence base indicates that trauma-focused CBT interventions uh, are most effective. And that includes uh, trauma-focused CBT and prolonged exposure. And the child that I'm going to highlight very briefly is a child in which we delivered a prolonged exposure therapy as the intervention of interest uh, in adolescents with PTSD. So in addition to trauma-focused CBT interventions, EMDR has um, growing evidence uh, for effectiveness uh, in this population. And trauma-focused CBT interventions have a number of common components, which I'm not going to uh, elaborate on. The question is sort of how do these interventions work? We don't know for sure, but uh, there are a number of hypotheses that have been put forward. Uh, in most instances, trauma-focused cognitive behavior treatments last um, an average of 10 to 20 weeks, or 10 to 20 weekly sessions. Um, they're usually delivered uh, individually rather than in a group context. 
and almost always involve some engagement with the parents or carers. And that can be particularly challenging uh, in our setting in South Africa, where in many instances you have youth coming um, for their uh, sessions without uh, a parent or caregiver. Uh, the other question is, do these treatments work in very young individuals? Well, we don't have that data uh, in uh, Africa. Uh, we know that uh, in most of the randomized controlled trials that have been conducted, participants have been eight years of age or older. So that is the cut-off limit. And so this is where there is a huge gap uh, in the literature. There have been a number of uh, more recent uh, trials of uh, cognitive behavior therapy uh, with a trauma focused in much younger children. Uh, so as was mentioned earlier today, medications are usually reserved uh, in this population uh, and there are international guidelines that will uh, explicitly or do explicitly state that drug treatments should not be offered. For example, the UK NICE guidelines are particularly uh, stringent about the use of pharmacotherapy for uh, youth PTSD. Then, um, Early intervention is particularly important, and I um, uh, was uh, very concerned following a study that we conducted uh, a number of years ago uh, in adolescent rape survivors, who we followed up, initially assessed within two weeks of the rape occurrence, and then followed up um, over a period of 12 months. And so they were seen at three months, six months, uh, nine months, and 12 months, and uh, found that, uh, in fact, uh, psychopathology, which manifested most commonly uh, as major depressive disorder, anxiety disorder, uh, and a variety of anxiety disorders and post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as other stress-related disorders, um, did not uh, diminish over the 12-month period. So even with uh, supportive counselling, not formal psychotherapeutic uh, intervention, uh, but formal counselling, referral, uh, psychiatric assessment uh, and, and so that was particularly concerning. And so the question is, um, to get back to uh, this slide, can early intervention prevent PTSD in this population? So, um, I, I, you know, individual psychological debriefing is not recommended but there is emerging evidence that self-directed online psychoeducation for caregivers and children uh, can um, help in the prevention of PTSD and there's insufficient evidence for the use of uh, trauma-focused CBT in the first three months. Um, and then, you know, the, the question is, so if these interventions work, um, can we actually translate them into frontline practice? And in our setting where uh, most of our adolescents who do receive care are actually seen in primary care settings, uh, at community clinics, uh, where we don't have um, clinical psychologists or uh, staff with um, adequate mental health training, uh, can we deliver these interventions? Can we disseminate them? Um, so I think we need to think about new approaches to care. Um, and so the, um, the concept of task shifting has been in existence for a long time. In fact, it was, um, it was first developed in the 1970s in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, where task shifting was uh, deliver, was used to deliver treatments by also auxiliary nurses uh, with a cater of uh, health professionals who used to deliver treatments uh, for uh, a number of uh, common conditions in that population. And then it took off uh, subsequently and it's been used particularly in the field of infectious diseases. So, you know, the African continent has been used in the context of treating uh, conditions like HIV and uh, TB and other infectious diseases. And it, it's really gained um, more attention in the mental health field uh, in the last decade. And there are different levels of task shifting and um, in the uh, trial that I'm going to talk about, we used uh, nurses who were uh, receiving um, advanced uh, education, so they're doing a one-year diploma in psychiatric nursing to uh, deliver uh, a, psych a psychological intervention to youth. Um, and so we recruited um, adolescents uh, from uh, schools uh, in the vicinity um, 
of, um, of, of Cape Town, and uh, these are all adolescents who had uh, been experienced, uh, who had experienced or witnessed a traumatic event and uh, met criteria for full PTSD or a sub-threshold PTSD. And because we wanted this to be um, a study of uh, effectiveness, where we wanted to assess effectiveness, uh, these adolescents uh, were uh, eligible for the study uh, if they had comorbid disorders. So this is really just to give you a sense of the uh, flow of participants through the study. Uh, we trained uh, nurses, as I said, they were trained over a four day period. Um, and this was a, an, a, an individually delivered intervention. So it was a, a randomized controlled trial comparing prolonged exposure therapy with supportive counseling. And the nurses in the study were trained in both of the interventions and um, delivered both interventions. Um, and adolescents could receive a seven to 14 weekly sessions of either intervention. And then we followed them up uh, after treatment uh, up to 24 months. So we currently have 24 month follow-up data and we're hoping to follow them up uh, to five years. Um, and um, I don't have a pointer, but what you see here is really just uh, an assessment of the primary outcome, which was um, the child post-traumatic stress disorder scale. We used both the clinician interview version, so that was rated by the uh, clinician. So we had uh, independent raters who were clinically trained to do the assessments at baseline, at midpoint, at treatment endpoint, and then uh, over the follow-up period. Uh, the nurses delivered the intervention. They were supervised on a weekly basis uh, by a clinical psychologist. Uh, all of the sessions were both video and audio taped and uh, adherence to the protocol. So that this was manualized intervention. We had both the prolonged exposure and supportive counseling uh, intervention that was manualized. And fidelity to the intervention was also assessed. Um, using 10% uh, of the uh, treatment sessions um, over, the, over the course of the trial. So in addition to um, significant improvement in, in post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, both clinician rated as well as rated by adolescents over time, um, post-intervention, there was uh, a maintenance of effect over time and so both interventions resulted in some improvement, but uh, or resulted in significant improvement, but there was greater improvement with the prolonged exposure therapy. Um, and this also uh, was true for uh, depression outcomes. So I think that uh, this was sort of the first trial that we conducted in PTSD, as far as we know, it's the first trial of PTSD using task sharing uh, in this way uh, on the African continent. Um, and we were able to show um, through the trial, but also because we conducted uh, nested qualitative studies where we evaluated the experiences of all of the stakeholders uh, in the trial, the nurses, uh, we uh, interviewed teachers uh, who had referred adolescents into the trial, as well as the adolescents themselves that um, these are interventions that can be effectively task shifted. There were some challenges uh, that were raised, particularly in the qualitative uh, component of the study. Um, adolescents said that um, they experienced more ongoing distress, those in the support of counseling versus the prolonged exposure intervention group. They described the, uh, the therapeutic relationship with the nurse counselors as being warm, they found these nurses to be accepting, maternal and trustworthy. The nurses themselves said that um, they benefited uh, tremendously from being trained and being closely supervised. They did say that uh, they would require uh, they would require the buy-in and support um, of the uh, health managers at the facilities at which they were in, in order to deliver uh, these interventions in a scalable and sustainable manner. So I think that um, you know this is really just a, a, a proof of principle trial showing that um, task sharing using um, interventions that um, 
I have a very good evidence base that don't have as much evidence for effectiveness in adolescent populations as in adult populations, and I'm referring to prolonged exposure therapy. Specifically, that you know, these are interventions that nurses with, who are psychotherapy naive, who've never delivered psychotherapy previously, never received psychotherapy themselves, uh, can, can deliver. Um, and I do think that you know, the next step would be to, um, to evaluate cost and to, to scale this up. So to do an implementation trial, to do a, a multi-site study that spans many African countries. Um, and you know, I think that uh, that is um, within reach. So given funding, <laughs> the availability of funding, it is within reach. Thank you very much. Sorry, sir. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for also going through very timely and very quickly. So, um, do you have any questions for Professor Sida? Sir? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I was curious if you could speak a little bit to the specific training that the um, workers got in the implementation phase. Um, as I understood, I think they were already psychiatric nurses, so they had the one-year program in order to become psychiatric nurses, and I'm wondering how long it took them to actually learn the intervention itself. So they hadn't completed the one-year diploma training. They had just started uh, when we recruited them uh, as um, nurse counselors for the study. They had just started their one-year diploma training. So in fact, they had not been previously trained in psychiatry. All nurses in their training do receive minimal, receive minimal exposure to psychiatry. Um, and your question around training, so there was a four-day period of intensive uh, hands-on training, uh, which included both didactic teaching as well as role play. And then the nurses were uh, supervised on a weekly basis by a clinical psychologist. Um, and this was done together with the video and audio recordings uh, because all sessions were video and audio recorded. I guess that's probably where the, the difficulties come when we're trying to then uh, scale up because of that sort of vision bit, which is often missing when we then try to scale up, I suppose. Um, if someone is a psychologist and is vested in this trial, then they spend a lot more time making sure that vision happens. Yes, I think that, um, the, so we had two clinical psychologists who provided the supervision, and their feedback was that, uh, you know, initially it was challenging because uh, I think of the newness and also not knowing um, how this trial was going to pan out but um, they really enjoyed the supervision. Um, and you, going forward, I think we wanted to video and audio record, or video record the sessions, um, obviously to monitor um, treatment fidelity to the protocols. Um, and in fact, there was just one protocol violation, and that was uh, by a nurse who was delivering supportive counseling, in that uh, the nurse, uh, she, she entered into a discussion about the trauma because it was not trauma focused, the supportive counseling um, component of intervention. I have a question, but I think you've already answered it. But th these were all psychiatric people that were in psychiatric nurse training, they weren't just nurses that were going to be in some other medical facility. They all wanted to do mental health work, they wanted to do mental health work, but they didn't have at that stage the training or experience in, in mental health care. Okay, so not just general? They were general nurses. Oh, they were? Yeah, who, were, who had just registered for a one-year diploma in psychiatric nursing. Okay, and so they all signed up to do, wanting to do this particular intervention? Yes. Yeah. yes. And did anyone opt out? Uh, we did have uh, an attrition of, I think, two of the counselors. Um, but the reason for their dropping out was because they um, felt they didn't have the support it was impacting on their, because these were primary care nurses, they were actually working in uh, community clinics, and so they didn't have the buy-in of 
and that was one of the um, issues that came up in the qualitative um, interviews. Uh, So now do I have to stand up still? <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. I, um, I, I, I had picked up on the issue because if we're going to talk about generalizability, it, it appears that it is something that is feasible for people involved in mental health in one way or another, as opposed to a nurse who's doing reproductive health or doing something else and then they get further training and then they offer this kind of training. So that, that is, I think, my, the, the point where I get uh, that the generalizability becomes a problem uh, because it's only generalizable. It appears among nurses or people who have an interest in, in mental health. I'm, I'm also uh, wary a bit. Uh, I've been reading a lot of work, especially from Ethiopia and other countries and Malawi, about uh, us concluding that uh, this works because I'm, 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 I would like it to be more granular. What, what exactly uh, does it works mean? So I, this has demonstrated it is possible to train them, it is possible to deploy them, it is possible to supervise them. When we say it works, what do we mean? So that, that has been a problem for me when I read a lot of task shifting uh, literature that I do not necessarily know what it works. Yeah. Well, the interventions yeah. work, yeah. Uh, and the primary outcomes were um, improvement and, in fact, a loss of PTSD diagnosis. And I haven't shown that data, mm. but this is what we showed yeah. that with prolonged exposure, uh, there was a loss of PTSD, so significantly. So, so and I don't have the numbers yeah. at hand. Um, and then we looked at a number of other outcomes, which were secondary outcomes, depression, um, we, we have measures of resilience, aggression, uh, so other behavioral outcomes. Um, but I think your question really speaks to whether the task shifting works. Yeah. And I think there are different ways in which that needs to be evaluated. And I really tried to tackle that through the qualitative um, through the qualitative piece of the study, uh, to really hear from all of the stakeholders involved whether this could work. Because the teachers, um, so the intervention was delivered at the schools, so I didn't say that. The intervention was actually delivered at the school, so the nurses went to the schools. And uh, maybe what I said about the nurse, these nurses uh, signing up for a one year diploma may be in some ways misleading because it could have been any nurse. Uh, these were not nurses working in a mental health care setting. They're primary health care nurses. They're doing a one-year diploma in psychiatric nursing. Um, so they're really doing but, advanced but there studies. But there's interest, work. though. There's an interest, interest. yes. And, the ne you know, the next step, so in fact, we, we are uh, in the process of we're planning a trial that would involve uh, a different cohort of nurses who are already kind of working at primary care clinics who not necessarily signed up for a one year if, if I compare that to usual care, uh, usual care in, in that setting, then perhaps we, we can start seeing whether it actually uh, makes a difference over usual care. In some settings, I understand usual care means nothing. Okay. Means nothing. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, that comparison perhaps still needs to be done. Uh, so that then we can say, yes, this approach works just as well as usual care, mm, yeah. or, or, or maybe so better. So we have another uh, RCT that has yeah. just been completed comparing trauma-focused CBT for adolescents with enhanced usual care, where we're contacting adolescents on a monthly basis uh, really just to monitor and refer if need be. Um, and the intervention is being delivered by, um, by counsellors. So we just have the last question, unfortunately because of time. Um, yeah. Thank you for the talk. Um, in context of talking about new approaches to delivering care for PTSD, 
um, and the role of task shifting. I'm curious about the, uh, the role of telepsychiatry and utilizing mobile devices to deliver appropriate evidence-based care, um, and whether that's something that's being considered um, in research. Um, so I've had limited experience of that, but we, we have just completed a pilot of a sleep intervention for adolescents with PTSD using a trauma-focused sleep intervention. So uh, primarily targeting sleep to secondarily improve PTSD symptoms and improve outcomes. And as part of that study, we required adolescents to, on their mobile phones, complete a sleep diary, and also uh, we used physical activity watches. We had initially thought of um, using actigraphy watches and collecting more sophisticated data, but we really wanted to see whether uh, this was going to be a feasible way of data collection. And we've had a number of challenges. We actually have a meeting next week to discuss uh, the outcome of the pilot. So, you know, watches getting stolen, uh, many adolescents don't actually have smartphones in our setting. We thought based on South African data, you know, on mobile um, uh, penetrance in the country that uh, our youth would all have smartphones, but that's not the case. So phones were stolen, watches were stolen. Uh, well, four watches out of, I don't know, about 40. <laughs> Uh, which is probably not too bad, uh, but I think that it's something that needs to be thought about really carefully uh, in our setting. Um, Thank you very much, Siren. So. Um,